So one of the first things that we do at annual conference is that we we gather those who are being ordained and they stand before the bishop and they stand before our annual conference, the collected clergy and laity, and they answer the historic questions that are asked of all who would serve the church. And these are questions that not, are not only meant for clergy, but they're also meant for us, all of us, the church, the faithful, the people of God. And there are two times in this questioning that there's always some nervous laughter. One time happens when the bishop says, are you in debt so as to embarrass yourself? And there's that kind of laughter, exactly what you just heard out of the choir, because these are folks who have just come out of seminary for the most part, and they have educational debt that is sometimes weighing them down, and there's this nervous laughter, and they go, um, no. But there's also this sort of laughter that happens when the bishop says, do you know our general rules? And will you keep them? And there's this, either there's that reaction, the stunned silence, or there's this laughter, not because I think our clergy, our new clergy, don't know the general rules, but that the nervousness comes in, will I be able to keep them? See, we live in a world of rules, don't we? The Old Testament contains 613 of them. 613 rules to keep if you are going to be, be a faithful person of God. And that's a lot. That, that's way too many. One, one individual tried to, just recently, tried to live one year keeping and observing all the Old Testament rules, and then he wrote a book about it. And some of those rules, quite frankly, are silly today. They don't make sense today. Robert Fulgum tried to simplify these life rules just a bit, and he wrote a little book called What I Really Need to Know About How to Live I Learned in Kindergarten. And even Robert Fulgum couldn't get it down too much. He did reduce it from 613 to 19, and they're simple rules, rules that are familiar to us, share everything, Play fair, don't hit people, put things back where you got them, flush. <laughs> I'm just quoting Robert Fogel here. <coughs> but somebody said to Jesus one time, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus didn't respond with 613, nor did he respond with 19. He really responded with one in two parts. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And that, that rule, that commandment, which Christ called as the greatest, really forms the basis of our general rules. Now, John Wesley was a simple man, and so he did not take that one rule of Christ and, and bring it back up to 613. He did, however, take it down to three. Three simple rules by which we live, or at least we strive to live. And there's this sweet little book called three simple rules, and we're going to be talking about those rules over the next few weeks because I think, and I was inspired by our annual conference to, to go back to our roots of who we are as United Methodists. And you're going to see during this next year, during these next 12 months, we'll have several of our sermon series that will take us back to our roots of who we are. But let me share with you a little bit of the preface of this book. It says, there are three simple rules that have the power to change the world. While they are ancient, they have seldomly been fully put to the test. But when and where practiced, a new world is formed. The Wesleyan movement is a prime example of this new creation that is formed when these simple rules are adopted as a way of living. I believe, says the author, we have reached a place where as a people of faith, we are ready to give serious consideration to another way, a more faithful way, of living as disciples of Jesus Christ. 
This way must be so clear that it can be taught and practiced by everyone. It must be accessible and inviting to young and old, rich and poor, powerful and weak, and those of every theological persuasion. This way of living was given to John Wesley in a time much like our own. And, and let me pause here to say it was a time of divisiveness, much like our own. A time of violence, much like our own. A time where we identified ourselves more with the ways we didn't agree with, with our commonalities. And the author continues, Now it is up to us to see if we will take it, teach it, and practice it until it becomes our natural way of living. A way of living that will mark our life together and our lives as individual Christians. I invite you to this radical journey that is marked by these three simple rules. Number one, do no harm. Number two, do good. And number three, stay in love with God. Simple rules to remember. And that's why our clergy could stand before the bishop and say confidently, yes, I know the general rules of our church. But it's that second part of the question, will you keep them? Maybe for five minutes I can keep them. <laughs> These are difficult rules to fully live out. And we're going to talk today about the first one. Do no harm. It's part of the Hippocratic Oath. It's part of the promise that doctors make when they assume their power and their privilege as doctors to first do no harm and live out in its fullest, to its fullest nth degree, this one single rule has the power to completely transform the world around us. Now, I want you to note what it doesn't say. It does not say avoid conflict. It does not say don't disagree. The, the issue, folks, in our world and in our community and in our homes and in our churches is not that we disagree with one another. The issue is we don't know how to handle ourselves when we do. But the first simple rule says this. Do no harm. And it's a rule that creates a safe place for us to reside while the hard work of conflict and disagreement and discernment is done. When we agree that we will not harm others, we allow for insight and for understanding to become possible. When we agree that we will not harm others, we create time and space to consider the consequences of our own behaviors and the consequences of our own actions and our words. And this first simple rule, do no harm, creates a climate in which healthy conflict the kind of conflict that pushes us forward rather than holds us back can take place. So what does it look like? What does it look like to do no harm? It's much deeper than physical harm. It's much deeper than not hitting one another. Remember, even Jesus reframed the command, Thou shalt not kill, to include actions like judging others, or insulting others, or labeling others. It is lived out in our lives in a million different ways. Big ways and small ways. Let me give you just a few examples. It means avoiding gossip. It means not speaking disparagingly of one another. It means not calling each other names. It means not manipulating facts to make yourself look better and someone else look wrong. It is not, and this one's the hard one for me, it is not assuming motivation for, on another person's part. Let, let me put it another way. Let me put it in the positive. It is assuming that we are all trying to do the very best we possibly can do. 
And, and starting from that place of saying, I know that your heart is pure. I know that your heart is good. And if we could just start there and, and begin from a place that everyone is, is trying to do the very best they possibly can do. It's about honoring every single person as a child of God who is worthy of God's love. And it is full inclusion of each and every person in all areas of our lives together. Do no harm. This year at annual conference, we had the responsibility of ratifying as an annual conference a proposal made by the general conference. I know that's maybe a bit confusing, but in the United Methodist Church, while we may have three simple rules, we have a very complicated polity. <laughs> and the general conference is the only body that can change our discipline, the way that we do life together. And the general conference has suggested a new statement in our discipline, and it must be ratified now by the annual conferences in order to become part of our printed way of doing life together. And it simply is this. It is a statement that all ministries of the church, all ministries of the church are open to all people, regardless of gender, age, and ability. And I will confess to you, when I saw that up on the screen, I said, you have got to be kidding. We have to vote on this? <clears throat> It seemed so obvious to me and so logical to me that, of course, we would never turn a ministry away from someone based on their gender or their age or ability, but it happens all the time. And I will confess to you that at annual conference, Ryan Klein and myself and Nick Fugate chose our seats in a very bad place. We were right in front of microphone seven. <laughs> And the bishop said, when this, when this statement came up on the screen, he said, are there any speeches against this proposal? And an individual got up to microphone seven to speak against the proposal. Because they said, what if a transgender person wants to serve in our community? That's not a gender. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was on the screen, and I turned to Ryan Klein and I said, wow. <laughs> and several of my clergy colleagues called me out and said, you need to learn to play poker better. <laughs> because it's clear where you stand on this issue. But we took a vote as an annual conference, and we won't know, to be honest, how it all turned out until all of our annual conferences have had the opportunity to vote on this. But I will hope that you will join me in praying that that statement is approved and that part of our discipline will say every ministry of our church is open to all people regardless of age or gender or ability. It's us deciding whether we will do no harm, whether we will live into the general rules. And when we choose to do this, when we choose to live into this first of our general rules, it means that we stand more firmly on ground of unity rather than disunity. And it means we lose our fear of one another. See, if I lose my fear of being hurt or harmed by another person, then I make room to love that individual. I can set aside my fear, we can set our side, aside our fear of being harmed, and we can find, to replace that fear, the room to love. So the question becomes this, why, why don't we live by it? Why do we fail so miserably at this rule that simply says, do no harm? I think we fail because it requires so much of us. It requires self-discipline, it requires humility, it requires us breaking the cycle of violence, it requires us trusting in God to lead and empower us to do that. We don't live out the simple rule, quite frankly, because we're too in love with being right 
to do no harm. Where we connect ourselves too strongly to an ideology or an idea rather than binding ourselves to the person of Jesus Christ. We don't live out this rule because we are unwilling to radically love as Christ loved. We're unwilling to give up power. We're unwilling to give up the certainty that we are right. We are unwilling to be the first to break the cycle of violence. And so we ask ourselves, is it even possible? Is this just one of those impossible rules that, that we can follow and know better than the 613 of the Old Testament? But I would challenge you, if you wonder if it's impossible to read any or all of the four Gospels, because there, in those stories, we find one who did. Jesus the Christ. God made flesh. Made flesh to show us that it is absolutely possible to do no harm. To live in a world, even a world that is in disagreement with what you teach and what you say and how you act. It is possible to live in that world and still do no harm. Even a casual reading of the life of Christ reveals that it is absolutely possible. It's possible because the one who calls us to follow this rule stands with us, forgives us when we fail, empowers us, and models for us exactly what it looks like. It is a challenging rule to be sure. It is a sacrificial rule always. But it is possible. It is completely and totally possible if we determine every day, every hour of every day, that we will invest ourselves, our energies, our hearts, our beings into healing instead of hurt, into wholeness instead of division, into harmony with the ways of Jesus rather than the ways of the world. And this is the vision behind this first simple rule. Do no harm. And I would imagine as a community learns to do this, whether it's in their homes or in their schools, in their workplaces, in their neighborhoods, in their church, I would imagine as a community learns to do this, they become so compelling to the world around them that folks wouldn't, couldn't help themselves but to ask what is going on in that place that they love each other so deeply and that they care for one another so fully. The author of this book, Three Simple Rule, reminds us that when two people are married and when they live together for a long, long time, something happens. And now I'm going to watch spouses look at each other. This is my favorite part. I wish I had a camera. Maybe I should get microphone 7 right here. But something happens. They start speaking alike. They start looking alike. I'm sorry, ladies. <laughs> when, when two people are married for a long time, they start looking a lot alike. And, and I wonder... For those of us who commit our lives to practicing this simple rule, this rule of doing no harm, I wonder if maybe we might start looking a lot more like Jesus. And who wouldn't want that? Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we offer this day a prayer of confession. For we confess that while we might know this rule, we don't always live it. And God, we ask you to forgive us for those times that we speak words that are hurtful. When we assume the worst of our neighbor. Even 
God, when we do harm to your creation, or we even do harm to ourselves, or we do harm to the gospel witness, forgive us. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, God, strengthen us to do better, to be more like Christ, to be the hands of Christ and the feet of Christ and the heart of Christ, to see with the eyes of Christ and love with the heart of Christ. Help us to do that, O oh God. Because I truly do believe that when we find our place to that moment, we really truly can change the world. But it is only by your spirit, and only by your grace, and only in your power that we dare try. So grace us, O Lord, as only you can. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.